Everybody is a wondering what and where they all came from. Everybody is a worrying about where they're going to go when the whole thing's done. But no one knows for certain, so it's all the same to me. I think I'll just let the mystery be. Some say once you're gone, you're gone forever, and someday you're going to come back. Some say you rest in the arms of the Savior if in sinful ways you lack. Some say that they're coming back in a garden, bunch of carrots and little sweet peas. I think I'll just let the mystery be. I think I'll just let the mystery be. All right. Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. This is Rob here at Smirking Gun Reviews. And, you know, I know these aren't as uh, regularly scheduled as people might like them to be, but uh, I try and, I'm trying to fit these in when I can. And so today we're finishing, finally. Because seriously, this has been a journey for this show on this channel. We're finishing The Leftovers Season 2 today with Episode 10. So I want to thank everybody who chooses to watch these because, again, this is like a labor of love to get through these. Uh, I think it's a really important show to talk about, and the journey to get here has been long and arduous, but I've been committed to finishing it off, and I'll be making them when I can, kind of like when I do Doctor Who. I'll be making them when I find the actual free time to talk about it. Uh, so for any of you that's new to the channel, uh, welcome. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe to the channel. Uh, notifications, all that stuff. If you're a returning subscriber uh, who's finally watching this show or somebody who's looking forward to these because you've already watched the show, welcome back. How's everybody doing? Today we're talking about I Live Here Now, the finale of season two. And I, you know, there's so much to say about this show and I've said so many things. And I mean, if you, I understand the, and and it's, this is a topic we've covered before, but it's important to keep cover just, to, again, just in case for people who don't watch every episode of these that I make. It, say what you will about Damon Lindelof, right? You could say whatever you want. There are some valid, valid opinions about his track record on television, movies, whatever. But every once in a while, something happens, even in a, you know, someone with that kind of track record where they nail it. And the leftovers is the thing they nailed. And, and if you don't agree with that, that's your opinion. But I don't know anybody that doesn't, that uh, watches this show and doesn't just love it. And you have to give it up to Damon Lindelof for this achievement in television. Wasn't recognized by any of the award shows. I almost feel like there should be a category for we fucked up. Just <laughs> call the category we fucked up at whatever big award show, the Emmys, and say, we're going to course correct. And this year, we're going to course correct and say, you know, we're going to give an honorable award out to Carrie Coon, Justin Thoreau, The Leftovers. Give it to The Leftovers. Say, you know, just have a category of this year we fucked up and this way we're going we're gonna to talk about a show. We're going we're gonna to honor a show that we fucked up on and it should be The Leftovers for like a few like categories. Because again, every time I watch it, I'm just I get floored. My jaw gets dropped to the floor at how fucking good it is, on every level. Every level. There's so dense, and there's so much story, and there's so much character, and the, everything in it—the acting, the writing, the production, the music, the way that they place the music. And the fact that, you know, if this is like, I think, you know, this is such a hard show for mass audience. This is not a mass audience show. It'd be great if it was, but it's just too much for your... There's a lot of people that can't handle hard... Well, there's a lot of people who can't handle shows that have no real answers. Especially in ones that deal with this kind of subject matter that, you know is not religious but is it's kind of like how lost turned out to be religious and i guess the signs were there and i just didn't want to see them but like in the end it was like oh really that's where we were leaning towards okay some people a lot of people can't handle that they want their shows to be soft soft yeah 
That's a great way of putting it. They want their, their shows to just be real, real easily digested. They don't want to have too many lingering questions because their lives are difficult enough. Why would I want to think when I watch a television show when I just want to have basic black and white emotions? And the leftovers does, isn't for those people. And apparently that was most people. That's most people. We like to think that we're like so different. Every one of us thinks we're so different. But the majority of you aren't. <laughs> I think the people that probably watch these videos uh, that like this show, I think a lot of the people that love this show are different. But the, to the casual viewer, they're not. No, most people are just not. They're the reason why we have NCIS for 100 years. I'm not saying those are bad shows. I am saying that's a bad show. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> not every bad, not every show that's been on forever, like, let's say, CSI, or not CSI, SVU, you know, Special Victims Unit. You know, like, that, there's, there's value in it, but, like, there's a reason those shows are on forever. It's because that they're, they're just comfort, comfort food for people that are just, they need it like they need a, a McDonald's in every town. And then every once in a while, you got a show like The Leftovers that comes out of nowhere and just kills it. And people can't grasp it. And it goes nowhere. And we got, thankfully, we got three seasons. We got a, a full story. And at the end of season two, holy... I was, I, there was one moment that I actually was like, oh God, I guess they don't resolve that till season three. I hadn't remembered so let's start talking about this because, holy crap, I'm already six minutes in and I've babbled on about all sorts of topics that are surrounding this show, but not about the episode. So everything comes together. Last week, last episode, I should say, <laughs> it's been three weeks since I reviewed this, we got the Meg backstory, which plays into this, which is why it's very important that we got all that story. But we get to see things finally all come together. Everything explained for all the characters. We know some of these things, but the characters don't yet. And we go all the way back to the night of the disappearance. And I, I just, ugh, boy, get it? You know, she, you know, Evie hands her dad the present. Don't open till I'm gone. And and just how good they were at pretending that they were into their lives, that they were living, and they weren't. They were living, you know, they were into this cult and they had to hide it from everybody. And, and if you guys know my channel and the video I put up last week about my wife and the uh, witnesses, uh, you know, getting away from that cult and how it felt and just how you had to put on airs when you didn't believe, when you didn't want to be a part of it. And it's like, except this is like in reverse, where you have a belief system that, you, you know, you're hiding from people. Because no one would understand it. And honestly, ugh, the guilty remnant, woof. So we see, like, immediately their commitment to this cause, this belief, this ideal. They get far enough away, they turn off the music, and they just sit back with those dead eyes. You know, when the one girl starts to cry, she just writes, don't. The acting in this is so good, and the re and it's be because I can't stand Evie. I can't stand her. And I can't stand her because she's very real. She feel all these people feel very real on this show. And that's why I cannot stand her. She's and it's it's just how I feel. It's just how I feel. Because I've seen people like her before. I've met people like her before. I've and when you're in a cult and you've got those kind of people that are brainwashed by choice the, and, 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 and looking for answers. And the way Evie looks, just her looks to people, this above it all look that starts to change once she reunites with her mother. Like when she's really faced with someone who's as passionate about whatever, you know, about her as Evie is about her guilty remnant thing. But I just can't stand Evie. I just can't. And I think it's partially like a reflection on what I've been through. And almost kind of seeing myself a little bit in her. And I think that that, you know, like how I believed in something for so long. It was so wrong about everything and, and, and how I was arrogant at times. Believing what I believed. 
feeling above other people, feeling like I know more than you. I'm in on something. Because that's what they think. Evie and her group, they all know. They're all on the inside track. They got the real juice, man. They know. Just like everybody else knows whatever religion or belief system they have. They know. We know everything that's going on. We've got the inside juice. Everybody thinks they've got it. So I think that her her hypocrisy, and I don't know if hypocrisy is the right word, but I see myself, my, my attitudes in her, and I think that I don't like that part of myself or that, that was when I was that way. And I think that that's, that reflection on it is one of the great ways of reasons why I don't like that character. I think the actress is great because she's really good at playing it. She almost, Even though she kind of reminds me of her character that she plays in the Miles Morales game, and I didn't like that either. <laughs> I mean, the, the character, not the game. Um, but they're taken in completely by this idea, and they're deliberately hurting their families. And they don't care. And if they do care, they're hiding it very, very well. Just the meticulous nature of the setup that they put out. You know, they left the phone on. They left the music on. They did all of this so that no one would come looking for them, so that they could do whatever they wanted. So they had to fake a departure. The level that you have to be at for that kind of deception is fucked. But this world that they live in is already pretty fucked. And they see, this is where we see the connection with Kevin. They see Kevin with the cinder block. He's awake, but not awake. They do nothing. They just kind of stare like, what are we witnessing right now? As he just jumps into the water to kill himself. Or whatever you know, purpose it was. Maybe subconsciously he was trying to get to where he needed to be before and it didn't work because as soon as he hits the water and they leave, the earthquake happens and we jump to the present where Kevin's coming out of the ground and Mike, you know, Michael's there and he has to try to explain to him what happened with his, you know, with his grandfather, Virgil, and everything. Which is fucked up, you know. He doesn't, Michael doesn't tell him the details of like, yeah, I buried him. He's dead too, you know, because Kevin knows if he's here, he's dead. He just doesn't need to know the details. I wouldn't want to know that in order to save me, because when you see this happen in the episode where Kevin is poisoned and dies, and then Virgil turns the gun on himself, it is like, it doesn't occur to you that he's doing it to go in there and make sure that Kevin succeeds. Maybe he also did it because he was, you know, of the guilt of everything that he had done in his life. What he did to his son. This was his redemption in death. Die in the world, take himself out for all the horror he caused here, but somewhere in the afterlife he could help one person solve their problem and get back to life, the life that they should have. It's crazy thinking. And again, I don't believe in any of this. But it's a fascinating story. So, Kevin, though, after coming back, remembers everything. All of it. He is cured, I guess you would say, in a way, of like all... Oh, some of the burdens, maybe, that are on him. But the near-death experience rocks his memory and he remembers seeing Evie. He knows they faked it, but of course it's just too little too late because John uh, after finding out like, well, we need to talk about the cricket. Alright, so earlier in the series there was that cricket that was driving him nuts and her, the present that Evie gave him was the cricket. And he thought it was so thoughtful that she gave him the cricket because she said it's like the best present ever, right? Because he couldn't, he was obsessing over where the cricket sound was coming from. He had to find the cricket and he couldn't do it. He just wouldn't stop annoying everybody with it. And so when he sees the cricket, he thinks this is a great gesture, but his wife Erica played brilliantly. Um, oh gosh, there's like a phone going off. Hang on one second. Okay, sorry, I had to wait for the phone to stop ringing. <laughs> <laughs> but played brilliantly by Regina King 
uh, Erica's part. Like, she's like, dude, she didn't do this because it was a nice thing to do. She did it because you wouldn't, with how she, you, because you wouldn't let it go. And when he says, fuck you to her, It's John all over. It is him, his problem the whole season and what's been going on inside John for years. He, he, he never accepted what happened to him from his dad. And, and this isn't a negative to the character. This is a man who has suffered extreme trauma and handled it a different way. We all handle things differently, and John, and it's made John a very unlikable character. And the thing is, again, I don't like this character, but it's not his fault. You're not supposed to like him. But once you find out everything that's gone on in this man's life, you do understand, and you now instead of just dis, instead of disliking him, I feel nothing but sorrow and pity. And it's just still coming out as this raw nerve rage. Because he can't accept anything other than his narrow view of how things have to be because of how everything went down with Miracle Texas and everything else. But the cops are there, his buddies, they tell him about the prints that are on the car that are Kevin's. They show up at Kevin's house. This is kind of a scary scene. Because, again, all of this feels very real. And since John is such a powder keg and he's got a gun, you don't know what he's going to do. And you can't really count on his cop buddies to stop him. But Kevin shows up with Michael, which also makes John angry. And Kevin knows immediately. He's like, you saw the prince, right? You know, I'm like, all right, I'll go with you. Which, in my opinion... I'm Kevin. I would never, ever in a million years go with those people because I know that wherever I'm going, I'm not going to be able to talk sense to this guy. I would have stayed on my property and had this whole thing out right there. But for drama's sake, Kevin goes with him to hash it out. I'll be right back, right? I'll be all right. Oof. Meanwhile, and this is, again, kind of sad because this is kind of the last hurrah for Jill. She doesn't really get anything to do after this season, really. And so her ro role here is just kind of holding the fort for her father. Because Lori's there, and he just wants you know everybody in one place... And when Lori tries to talk to Jill and say, you know, you're going to have to talk to me eventually, Jill just shuts her down in tears. But doesn't throw her out because she says, you know, well, Dad wants us all here. He says not to leave. But at the same time, that's a perfect reason for Jill doesn't want her to leave at the, at the same time because when would she, you know, she's, you know, the abandonment issues. You know, she hates and loves her mother at the same time. Doesn't want to talk to her, but never wants her to leave because if she leaves, when would she ever come back again? How do you know? Like, it's that, believe me, I know that too in my story about being abandoned by my mother. Except I don't care if I ever see her again. <laughs> in my case, I don't care. I wish I cared. Um, and then we have the crazy scene with Nora and the baby and Mary. The baby's crying, which if anybody again knows me, knows I can't stand. The, the sound of a baby crying is like the worst noise in the entire universe. Um, but she puts out a tape and it's them talking about the failed pregnancies that, that they had, that, you know, these tape recordings. And just them talking about Jesus, like Jesus will fix all of this. You know, Mary's catatonic. They, Mary's pregnant and catatonic. 
And when Nora just can't take listening to this anymore, she th- just smashes the, the radio in one, one swoop. She smashes the radio and says, fix that, Jesus. <laughs> Nora Durst, played by Carrie Coon. I know I've said it before. I got this shirt just so that she could be on. I would have say I have a shirt with Carrie Coon on it. Not to mention, Jesus Christ, I can play like xylophone on this guy's abs. Oh. Wow, this video is weird. So, Nora, I, look, Carrie Coon, I would get a t-shirt. I want a t-shirt that's Kerry Coon just saying, fix that, Jesus. As soon as that happens, though, an earthquake happens, another earthquake, and Mary wakes up. And Nora takes her to Matt. It's this very tearful reunion. It's very sad. It's one of the few happy moments that has happened on this show. And and, and Mary finding pregnant at the same time you've got Nora being attacked by this lady who keeps showing up saying that's not your baby and also at the same time that Meg and Tom arrive her talking you know him saying to her there is no family and she's like well where'd you get that idea and he's like looking at her like you you fucking crazy asshole and she says, family is everything. So she gets in her RV and goes to the bridge. And of course, they're there to stop her. And they're like, well, you know, the place is closed because it's the fourth anniversary. And, you know, the town people want to reflect on this alone. They want to think about it. She's like, well, what do they have to reflect about? Nothing happened here. But I do have 35 pounds of plastic explosives. Will that work? And she charges the RV onto the bridge and gets arrested. But as she's getting arrested, and don't ask me how she frees herself later, because they don't show that, the three girls appear out of the RV in front of the whole town. Well, all the crowd of people that have been waiting to get into Miracle. And we all know that she, for sure, you know, like, the the characters all find out now that she staged it. Now, unbeknownst to John and Erica, you know, her their daughter has just reappeared. And John is in a vet's clinic confronting Kevin about what he knew and what didn't know and what role did he play and all this. Because he's just assuming that Kevin fucking killed her and the girls and he's going to find out some crazy story about that. And what made you remember all this all of a sudden? He's like, I died. And of course, saying any of this stuff to John is like, just, nope. Tries to explain to him what, and he's like, you know, you want me to tell you something? I, you know, how would I know about your grandfather and all of this? And he tells him, I'm sorry for what your dad did to him. But he does, he's denying it still. He can't reconcile why his daughter would do something like that because nobody could reconcile with this. Unless you knew. Evie was so good at being living a life. And again, I can totally relate to this. Having to put on a completely different personality in front of people to hide is... Is, was in my wheelhouse for years. But to anybody else, it'd be like, no, how, how could you reconcile this? And he talks about, you know, she loved us. And Kevin's like, well, maybe she didn't. He's like, what? And he's like, maybe she didn't love you. And it's like, fuck, Kevin. I mean, I know I like to spit truth, but shit. You tell that to a man like John who's got a gun and exactly what happens you think is going to happen happens and he shoots kevin and oh god i you know i know this is a weird thing to reflect about and talk about about the episode but god damn the violence always looks so good on the show it's so real looking the way he shoots kevin just so i just the production of this show and how they insist upon things looking realistic And again, jaw on the floor because Kevin just came back to life, right? 
And as soon as John leaves, after doing immediately set upon by people saying, It's Evie, come on! And now they're all faced with the fact that there she is on the bridge with 35 pounds of plastic explosive, supposedly. And when Nora sees this through the binoculars and there's Matt standing next to her and he's like, the three girls, and she's like, you know, the ones who departed. And I just loved how she's looking at her brother and how she says that to him. Just, there's a tone there that only... I don't know. It's just so well performed. The present, like, it's... It fits so well with Nora and Matt's dynamic to say it and say it like that. In the crowd... They're all screaming and loving it because they're going to blow up the bridge and, 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 and the crowd loves it. And you know why? Because people suck. Yeah. People as a whole suck. These people have been sitting down there, especially people that are under this kind of duress. They've been sitting down there forever waiting to get in to get their piece of the miracle and they've been denied entrance. When you deny people entrance into paradise is what they think it is, right? They think it's their ticket to safety and, and, and not being departed again if it ever happens. When you do that, it, you get the results that they have here. So they're just, they're, we like to see people fail, things fail, People, you know, sit, you know, civilizations crumbling. We cheer for it because we don't, we didn't get to be there during the good parts. We were denied it, and that's where a lot of people's baser instincts go to. Is we cheer the downfall of something good and positive, or what was good and positive, because we couldn't be a part of it. And that's harsh of me to say, and I don't fucking care. I stand by it. So. We hear Eric is in church with Michael and we hear the bathtub lie. He gets up in front of everybody to talk about it now. Water came down the stairs, mom came in, why'd you do it? And she said, I just wanted to see what had happened. Which kind of tracks with Evie's character. Michael knows his sister pretty well. But that's not what happened. She was crying so loud. She was so upset about everything that had gone on in her life, about her father being in jail for what he did. That he had to turn the water up so loud that she wouldn't feel weird about crying to let it out. So Evie's problems started a really long time ago. She felt abandoned by her father. And this is where Michael reveals to the town what he really thinks. And that is that we may be the 900 or whatever, 9,000, whatever number it is, that were spared. But we weren't spared. People were disappearing before this happened. People are disappearing after it's happened. Just because this place didn't have anybody to part doesn't mean that shit didn't go down because of it. And we're all fooling ourselves that we think we're some sort of special chosen group of people. We're not. We are all still suffering in our own way. Which is a suffering is a huge theme of this show. We were not spared. Again, instantly, this is when someone comes in to say what's going on. And Erica, and again, Regina King, phew, Regina King, in this episode, charges the bridge, charges to her daughter, grabs her, and without hearing any dialogue, because we don't need to hear the dialogue. Why? Because we know. Any parent would know what this conversation is going to look like. So they had probably dialogue written down, and Erica, you know, I'm sorry, Regina King delivers it, to her daughter who goes limp in her arms and the, just watching the passion and the confusion and the fear of all come out in this actress's performance in this scene is just brilliant and again like I said you don't need to hear any of the dialogue it's universal and de just devastating as you start to see the realization kind of roll over her. Who is my daughter? Who is this person? Who, again, like I said, Evie kind of starts to break a little bit. Just a little bit. You see tiny little momentary cracks in her dead eyes. Because it's her mother 
and she is just laying it out there. But her equal commitment to her ideal is just as fucking crazy as anything. You know, imagine that feeling as a parent. Trying to understand if, you know, you roll up on your kid, you find out your kid's like a terrorist or something. Nor is confronted once again with the lady who keeps telling her, you know, the baby's not hers, telling and she's just like, shut the fuck up! <laughs> again, Nora. But we find out that the GR has been here the whole time. Meg's followers have been sitting there in wait amongst all the other fucking people. They take off their clothes, they switch over to their guilty remnant robes, and you find out, because Erica goes into the RV, that there's no bomb. There is no plastic explosives in the truck at all. And this whole thing was a big distraction to get everybody so freaked out and pushed off the bridge. They're just trying to protect the town at this point, the people that are there, right? These are just park service people, by the way, with, you know, some of them have guns. This is... They don't. They are not equipped for this, and this gets the guilty remnant to be able to just lead everybody that's been waiting into the town. Nora's baby is well. Nora's found baby is kidnapped by the taken by the lady who keeps showing up. And when you see her, Nora's desperation to, to get the baby back, it, the way they filmed this too, I didn't mind the shaky cam at all. Her desperation of like that. Not again. Not again. And to find the baby on the bridge. This was a disturbing... Like, I, I can... I've seen a lot of things that disturb me, that should disturb me, that don't. And seeing that baby... And again, I'm not a big fan of kids, but I'm not a heartless monster. And seeing that baby on the bridge by itself, laying down as people charge running full tilt across the bridge and I'm like, oh God, do not tell me this show is going to show me a trampled baby. I can't handle it. I don't like babies crying. Doesn't mean I like seeing them dead. And when she finally gets to the baby and people are stepping on her and everything, it's like, oh my God. And then Tom shows up, pulls her up, rescues her from this situation, puts her in the RV, telling her that everything is safe. Now, after during all this, we've forgotten about Kevin. I mean, I never have. I, this, I love Justin Thoreau, but we finally get to Kevin, who wakes up in the hotel bathroom again. He has died. The gunshot killed him. So first the grandfather kills him, <laughs> then his son, the, 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 first the father kills him, then the son kills him, right? So the grand, you know, Virgil, the man who hurt Ke uh, John killed Kevin to save him. Then John kills Kevin to kill him. Now Kevin's back in the hotel. And I mean, his reaction, right, is just perfect. Motherfucker! <laughs> As he desperately tries to recreate for a minute the situation, thinking maybe my dad's back in the TV. I just got to switch things around. But he goes in to pick new clothes because he's naked again. And in this time, he grabs his cop uniform. And as soon as he dons it, the phone rings and finds out that there's a problem in the hotel lobby bar and the cop is being accosted down there and you got to get down here quick. And when he gets down there, he, all he finds is a karaoke uh, session going on. And we see the man from the bridge from the earlier episode, International Assassin, um, who I, the actor has been in a lot of things and I really dig him quite a bit. Um... It's uh, Bill Camp. Bill Camp, who was the man on the bridge who had the noose and was like, hey, you know, like, just do this, you know. And he's confronted this guy again. He's like, hey, man, you, I know you know me. How do I get out of here? And he goes, well, you have to sing. And Kim is like, I'm not doing that because it's fucking stupid. And you know what? That's the absolute correct way to handle that because it is. But he goes, that's what you got to do. You gotta give up, and you know, and I, and it just is perfect. So he gets up there, and he sings "Homeward Bound," and I, you know, 
and I, it's I'm not a great big fan of that song, and but it's it fits here and it works, and it's great hearing Kevin sing and he can't sing again, because I love that Kevin can't sing. Why? Because everybody that picks up a fucking microphone on shows just suddenly has like well trained, right? I can forgive the fact that Kevin's cut like goddamn crazy. Look at that. We never see him work out. But I can accept that. What I did wouldn't accept is if all of a sudden Kevin's a fucking classically trained singer like most actors are. And even if he can sing in real life, I like that Kevin, the character, can't sing. But the passion of the song and when he starts like life flashing before your eyes, seeing things, images from his life that are of consequence and importance of people. And he's, the passion starts to make the song better. His voice sounds better. And sometimes that's all you need. And those memories and those thoughts, and as he's singing it, thinking about everything he's left behind, all the people waiting for him that if he doesn't come back, they'll never see him again. He, he realizing how much he, he doesn't want to die and how much he really loves these people. And he wakes up. And he finds his dog. He finds the bullet that went through him. And of course, when he leaves, the town is just trashed and on fire. Because again, you let these people, you made these people wait outside. You treated your place like an amusement park. You treated it like a, a, a monument, a temple of something, you know, whatever, like a, like a whole town church. And they turned on them. And now it's like Sodom and Gomorrah in this bitch. <laughs> Kevin finally finds uh, the health care, the, the urgent care place that Erica works at. And guess who else shows up there looking for Erica? John. And now John is having to face the man he killed. He's like, I killed you. Nope. And then when he's cleaning Kevin's wounds, he's looking at this man. He killed him. I killed you. You shouldn't be sitting here. Faced again with something that he can't possibly believe in, he starts to break down. And he's like, I don't understand what's happening. And Kevin's like, I don't fucking know either, man. But it is. And John finally just, it's like finally accepting the miracles do happen. And, and like, and whether you believe that shit or not, you know, it, it's just a great story. And the two men kind of carry each other home, in a way. As the Pixies, Where Is My Mind, instrumental, starts playing again. And I got goosebumps because the Pixies, Where Is My Mind, is like in my top five songs of all time. And I love it. You know, I can't sing much either, but you know that. With your feet in the air and your hair on the ground. Just ah, uh. and it's just a do 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 do. Uh. And John is afraid to go home, cause he kind of should be. He's like, what if nobody's there? And Kevin goes, well then you just come over to my house, because that's the kind of guy Kevin is. You can. Kevin knows, understa Kevin understands at why John did what he did. And so John goes home, and Kevin goes home, and there's everybody there waiting for him. All the people that matter in his life. Jill, right there front and center, Lori, Matt, Mary, Tom, and then Nora. Just that, uh, her coming out of the shadows. You're home. And Kevin just in tears. As we re see the look on his face of just absolute relief that he's finally home with his family, where he belongs. And that's the end of the season two. I did skip over where Kevin finds Meg in the visitor center. And he's like, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? And he's like, I live here now. And then she starts singing the miracle song. And he just realizes, okay, this is, 
okay, you're you're here and you fucked all this up and now I gotta clean it up, so I'm gonna fuck off and go home to my family. So that's the end of season two. It's a big episode. This is an over an hour long episode. It's like an hour and 15 minutes almost long episode. So this is a bigger video. And we got to end it so we can get to season three eventually. But just such powerful stuff. And again, this is why it's in the top, 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 top tier of television of all fucking time. So anyway, if you liked this review, please hit the like button. Comment, share, subscribe, hit the bell for all notifications. If you hated it, but you just wanted, you can't look away, you just want to know what I'm going to say to piss you off, well, you can look right here and get a new memory. So those of you who did like it, put on shades, look away, and if you have epilepsy, get out of the room as fast as possible, because we're going to give these people the last 41-ish minutes back. Here's the memory I choose to give you. Have a great night. We'll see you in season three. If you have a wristband or a dispensation for them, I'm gonna have to ask you to turn around. I have 35 pounds of plastic explosive. Will that work?